I really do think we're sitting in the center of gambling normalization. Here comes a sort of chaos that can't be policed to sports. And I'm glad that Amino Hassan, who has worked in an NBA front office. And think it's being policed. I mean, again, as a totally unbiased party on a show that is proudly presented by our friends over at DraftKings, this is it being policed. Where, where is this take? Because you're not the only one guilty of it. Where is this take coming from? That this is some out-of-control problem when we only find out about it when it's being controlled. Okay, I don't know what that you, sound was at the end it's of just, that. It's just, this is the process working. I'm glad that Amin El Hassan is in town because he can walk us through what I believe is the process working that ends up making the story that's in front of us on a Michael Porter brother I did not know exist until <laughs> that's yesterday. That's how he should be mentioned, by the way. <laughs> I, 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 until he, well, he serves as an avatar for me on, oh, okay, so whatever the gambling quote-unquote problem is going to be, that's going to be the most overt of it. We've got cash coming in on an under that is not just suspicious, but guilty. So, I mean, walk us through the mechanics of the business and everything happening as sports gets involved with gambling. Because this is, the details of this are the most overt thing we've seen since the 1919 Black Sox scandals of, oh, this guy did this. He just went out with an eye, and, um, an eye ailment that no one believes in because he can and doesn't even fake his way through fixing his numbers in this game. So I, I would say that uh, Headache Smith at Arizona State in the 90s was bigger than this for sure because that was actually a guy who was really good and could impact lines and stuff like that. Uh, I would also agree with Mike that it's like saying, oh, man, Someone got caught robbing, like, oh, this, we're, we, we're not doing anything. It's like, well, no, that's the whole point. That's the point of policing is that there's a police that catches people doing things. It's not that it's going to be zero. And, by the way, we're speaking from a very American point of view because gambling has been integrated into European and other international sports for decades. Like, the idea of having a sports book in your venue – that's normal in Europe. Here we're like, oh my God, the Wizards opened a, a sports book in their venue that, like this three or four years ago, and people fainted. But like, just because it's new to us, doesn't mean it's new. But we're repressed about our of American course. sports stuff, and so this is the this is the world coming to American sports. And of course, where there's going to be pearl clutching. What do you mm. mean? This is where sportsmanship exists and amateurism. And and this isn't where business is. We're pure about our sports. Respect our sport. So with regards to is gambling a problem, like or not gambling a problem, is, is this type of behavior a problem? I don't think so because for the most part, the what's the incentive for the inside man to go along with it? What's the incentive? Money. Money, right? So – when you look at the players, by and large, now I know Jonte Porter is a two-way guy, not making a gajillion dollars, and more importantly, not having the kind of longevity that would indicate, oh, man, if I just keep doing this, I'm going to make a lot of money over the span of my career. He can end his career, but he can also make a million dollars in a night. Yeah, but, like, that's not that – doesn't, that doesn't move the needle, right? Like, so people say, for instance – Rudy Gobert was trying to insinuate that referees are in on this. It makes no sense for an NBA referee to be in on something like this because if you do a good job as an NBA referee, your career is going to be 10, 15, 20 years of just making this money and, be, and having a very well-to-do lifestyle, right? For most NBA players, they're making the type of money that you're saying a million dollars. You think – there's somebody out there who gave him a million dollars. I'm just to, saying that on this kind of bet, when you, I thought the prop numbers on right. this, right? You can only bet certain amounts right. on props. So I would like to know what's true and what's not true about that being DraftKings' <laughs> biggest winner in a night. The, like uh, you could game the system in a night if you're a player fixing it with a certain amount of money that would make it worth Michael Porter's brother I didn't know about until last night to say I don't think they'll catch me doing this, and I can I can make a few. Million million dollars in a night Allegedly. well Allegedly. calvin ridley in terms of name recognition is generally an outlier and if you see like the the alleged crime that he committed 
the volume isn't such, but those are the typically the tier of player you go after in these. Uh, while many in our audience may not know it, over the last decade, close to 200 professional tennis players mm -hmm. were implicated in a gambling ring, and they were the lower tier players yep. because they were deemed the most corruptible. They're the most corruptible because they don't make money. Right? They're also the most expendable, too. Like, if you're going to send a message, send a message with lower tier players where it's kind of like, hey, look what couldn't happen to you. Are you, you. speaking to the Otani conspiracy theory? Yeah. I <laughs> no, no, no. Free no. eBay, by the way. But, like you, <laughs> but to your point, you said earlier, yeah, you can have a long career as an NBA referee, but that doesn't mean you didn't have a, a bad night one night and now you owe this bookie or somebody on your ass for this big amount of money. So it might behoove you to make a big bet tonight. You Allegedly. Feel me? But I, Allegedly. I, I guess my thing is it's so easily detectable, I think. Like, People know. Like, with, a, with a more legalized standard, yes. Yeah, like it's easily detectable. Like there's something happening here that's weird, right? And Which is, a, we saw it a couple of weeks ago in the Temple basketball game. As they made a run, they were embroiled in this, hey, what is this very weird volume? So, because they can see the money coming in, right? Same thing with this situation. We saw the money coming in. Same thing with Tim Donahue. Like we saw, and it was just his game. That was that was a smoking gun that that Netflix documentary never ever acknowledged. The only ones that had action were the ones that he ref. He was trying to let that all oh, these refs are doing it. But when you look at the numbers, the only ones that had a bunch of action on it were the ones that he was refing because he was the one. I mean, if you're bringing us the perspective of Headache Smith, okay, mm -hmm. a '90s basketball player who was a star player and gambling that way, where mm -hmm. you've bought a star player. This seems to be like more easy, easier, guaranteed money. If you can get a prop under and tilt the scales to make an amount of money to be DraftKings biggest wager of the night in one night by buying one player who's willing to go out of a game with an eye injury, you can make more money and control your results a lot better than trying to bet on Headache Smith controlling an entire game. I would, I would argue, first of all, Headache was easier to get to because he was paid zero dollars as a collegiate basketball player versus Jonte Porter who's making some money, right? But at the end of the day, there are limits to how much you can put on props. There are limits, like when you say it was their, it was their most popular uh, bet of the night, that wasn't one person coming in, but give me $12 million on John Tate Porter. No, you can't do it that way but that's in a prop bet. That's what I'm saying. But it's you yeah, can a bet, lot of books limit. But, but you can bet an amount of money to make it a significant amount of money that can buy a fringe NBA player. I, 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 I doubt that, that that can be a long-term yeah, thing. I, 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 yeah, I it's don't think. It's just not worth the squeeze. No, you may see isolated incidents, yeah. and those, uh, those bets typically have a, a, a volume that will raise several flags. And I do think that – while we're so, you mentioned the UK, it's so heavily regulated over there, and it's taken several evolutions. And I think here in the United States, certain books here in the state of Florida, there there's a compact that states if you go to that gambling platform, you can't bet college props. And you, there are different yeah. ways around this, different evolutions of this. Books maybe make a stance. You can't bet under. You can't take college props uh, on certain books. Have already made that stance, depending on the uh, the bylaws on how they got legalized there. I think we'll ultimately get better and better with this stuff. Better and, with an E. Yeah. Well, well, even people betting by proxy, the data does not lie. A suspicious, uh, a s suspicious action on a game sticks out like a sore thumb to these to these entities and they share that information immediately. I think that we're looking at it into it a lot deeper than it probably is. I think it's a bonehead Bang. move by Bang. a young man who made a bad decision. Right. I'm pretty sure as an executive in the NBA, you've had a, a whole bunch of guys make bonehead moves over the years, I mean. Yeah, not I mean not not a gambling style, oh, but yes, damn. we almost got him. Yeah. <laughs> I was not familiar with your game, sir. That was you but know, if, almost but got if, her a guy. If a young player did have a gambling problem, mm -hmm. how would they have done it? I mean, uh, I guess like John Tate Porter. I'm, I'm allegedly, just, allegedly, allegedly. But I, I just I, because the other thing also is just like it's the weirdest prop bet in the world. Like I want to bet the unders on John Tate Porter. Like yeah. automatically, <laughs> DraftKings is about the teller's like, like who. Not, yeah, like, hold on for a second. But do we know how much money is involved with the bets? Like, that part matters. I feel like we can make it about uh, the, nothing. The detail that we know is that it was the single biggest moneymaker in terms of, of prop action. Of that day. Of that day. And and the red flag is, it's not just a, an over-under 
on a prop bet, but the over-under is so small. It's not an over-under on a, a six and a half. It's an over-under on a 0. 0.5 or a 1, 1. 1.5. What, one other thing to that point, Greg, is if this were a sophisticated gambling operation behind the scenes, the the – the move can't be, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the game, and then I'm going to go, ow, I- I've got to go back to the, I- I- oh, bubble guts. I've got to go back to the, oh. This begs I the can't... question. This begs the question. If you were a gambler yes. and you were in the NBA mm-hmm. and you were getting away with it, how would you go with it? It's Bobby? such a good question. You want, it's you such want a good question. Because this is the worst way. I, my tummy hurts or my eye hurts. I, is the it, it, What's worse than that? What's a, what's a lamer, more obvious way to fake your way out of a game than my eye hurts or my tummy hurts? Punch somebody. <laughs> Just turn around and haul off and not, do the Draymond. Just choke somebody out 16 seconds into but the it, game. It's, okay, it's, it's not a smart crime because there are going to be questions <laughs> exactly. after the game, but it's less lame than my eye hurts. The, the, I think the bubble guts one got me better. The, the, eye, the eye hurt because apparently he has had an eye issue. So he was leaning on this, hey, guys, remember that time I messed up my eye? Like, it's still acting up. But to say, oh, that Kung Pao chicken doesn't agree with me. Like, that's kind of hilarious. What are your thoughts on bigger balls in the NBA? (laughs) Bigger balls in the NBA to mitigate the – guys. I'm not going for this thing. I understand you think. He wants to fix the league. You know how in the WNBA they have smaller balls? Not Uh fix it, not fix it In the NBA, we're we're jacking up all these shots from way downtown, Uh and we can mitigate that by just making the ball a little bit bigger. So the likelihood that you make it, because we're shooting the balls at historic clips right now, it, it goes down somewhat. And then people realize, let me get closer to this hoop because this ball, uh, this ball is a little bit bigger now. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea. I, I don't, well, what's I, your you, idea for fixing you, the game? Have you ever seen – Just you, trying to solve you know problems what, here. You know that NBA players in the offseason work out with these things called medicine balls that are like mm. larger than a basketball yeah. and much heavier? Oh, that's – I didn't even think about making it a medicine ball. Oh, it seems like they're plenty of practice there and they don't have an issue with yeah. it. Medicine so. balls don't dribble well, though. Not good bouncers, yeah. no. They're good for shooting, though. Make it heavier. Make it bigger and heavier. Bigger balls, hey, 2024. Yeah. Bigger, so, heavier balls. I mean, what about my good idea? Limit – each team to 10 three-point shots a game. That way, you don't only limit threes. This is it's new strategy. and improved Dan Levatar show with the Stugas. Gamble on by DraftKings. What if I'm behind by 15 going into the fourth quarter? This man consistently makes me think about baseball, makes me happy to think about baseball. I associate him with baseball more than a great many players who have ever played the game, and I'm sure that's one of his greatest legacy prides. Uh, Tim Kirchner is also a friend, friend of the show, friend of mine, and he has had an unspeakably hard time that he would never complain about publicly uh, at home because it, to do so would be undignified, but he has dealt with grief and loss and stuff that really hurts. And I was thrilled the other day when he called me and he told me that he was starting a podcast with his son, Jeff. Is this a great game or what? New episodes are going to be every Tuesday. He is late to the podcast game. His background is and he doesn't know how technology works. But for him to be able to do this with his son uh, uh, late in in his career reminds me of what I was able to do with my father on television. And so I was just really happy for Tim that you will get to spend a day a week with your son talking baseball because that sounds, if you ask me, how Tim Kirkshin would want his grandfatherly years to go if he had imagined them 40 years ago. What do you mean I get to talk baseball with my kid one day a week and they're going to pay me for it? Right. And that's exactly why I'm doing this, Dan. And the reason I'm doing it is because it's my son and I love him. He's also a genius, a magician with technology. So I tweeted the other day for like the first time in two years because I'm so bad at it. But he set up the whole tweet for me, which included video. I couldn't have done that in a million years. So he set it up for me on my phone and he said, Dad, on Monday morning, all you have to do is press this button, post, and then you'll be on. Otherwise, because friends of mine said, how did you know how to do that? The answer is, I don't know how to do anything. So he is helping me through that. 
I will provide baseball content and he will provide content on all sorts of other things since I only know about baseball and a little bit about basketball and nothing else. Let me explain something else to you, Kirchin. What your son will be able to do is cash on cash in on grandpa's brand in baseball from every <laughs> angle because he simply knows how to use Twitter. The, the crew here is laughing at you, Tim. Uh, Juju and Tony are laughing at you because you think he's a technological genius because he can clip something. Nice. <laughs> Because he can type Damn. stuff on the tweet and then send it, I think, is the Don't technological Don't get access to your bank part. accounts, you know I'm what I mean, Tim? I'm laughing at this man's background. Like, what's behind this yes. curtain that's so Tim, bad? Tim, <laughs> it's not because your son's a genius. It's because you're a fool. Damn. I'm an idiot. I'm the that. first one to tell you that. I don't know anything. And he's in country music talk. And and he's thrown, you know, country. I called it country Western music until about three months ago when he finally said, Dad, that's not what it's called anymore. It's country music. So I'm going to learn something about that. Uh, among many things, while we do this show. So it's not just going to be pure baseball, me telling stories. It's going to be back and forth, me and my son. And hopefully I'll learn something from all the things that he knows that I know. Well, hopefully Jeff will learn something from our show because when it's called Is This a Great Game or What? The, sh the, the name of it should be I'm going to take what's left of grandpa's uh, money or grandpa's <laughs> knowledge or uh, that he is going to use the Kirchin brand – to branch out into podcasts when you normally don't care about podcasts. Certainly you don't listen to them and you don't know how to download them. I don't know how to download them. I don't know how to listen to them. I don't know how to do anything. And you're right. I'm trying to help my son, who, by the way, doesn't need any help. He's doing really well in Philadelphia as a morning talk show, music country music host i'm just doing this because it's something i always wanted to do he's my son we have great chemistry we have great fun together and that's what the only reason i'm doing if he cashes in on me if we make any money on this he's getting it not me i don't care about that all right i want to get in the bidding i want to get in the bidding for this podcast i don't know if i can buy it from espn it's kind of you're just announcing it I'm, this might be tampering but i'd like Whoa. to get in on bidding on whatever it is this podcast becomes because on one of the episodes you called me the other day and you were giggling uh, the one time I put you and Mike Shore together at microphones, you talked for 50 straight minutes in a way on South Beach Sessions that people found delightful. One of your first podcasts is going to be him and you just geeking out on the passion of baseball, right? People love listening to you on baseball, and you're like a kid opening baseball cards when you talk to Mike Schur. Right. And we open baseball cards on uh, several segments where they just open a card. And my son says, all right, tell the story about this guy. Mike Shore was so great. I told him we only need 20 to 30 minutes. We went 45. We could have gone four hours and 45 minutes. And that's how great he was. It wasn't even, Dan, a question and answer period. It was a three-way conversation between three people who love baseball two of us who are unhealthily addicted to the game. And Mike told me about three stories that I've never heard before. And he's, I do this for a living. And he knows stuff that I don't know about baseball. It's embarrassing, but it was so great. <laughs> he told us a story where Manny Ramirez went to buy a motorcycle and he didn't think he could afford it because it cost $95,000. So the guy said, Manny, you're a major league player. You can afford this. And he said, okay, I'll pay for it now. But I left my wallet at home and he looked at his buddy who was standing right next to him and said, can I have $95,000? He, he thought he had it on him. That's one of a million stories that Mike, Mike sure told that made me laugh out loud. Uh, Manny uh, wore a $60 earring and didn't seem to know the value of money because he uh, was in the neighborhood that I had just bought a home in very early in my career. The, 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 the area was just growing out. It was just beginning. It was not expensive land or homes, and he wanted to buy a house there for his family, and he asked his agent, uh, can I afford this house here? And his agent told him, Manny, you can afford the whole bleeping neighborhood. How do you not know? How do you? But, but Tim, you've got all sorts of stories like that. Where I, I want to get into the Otani stuff with you, and I want to get into um, some of the elements here of how much was Otani relying on his translator as like an all-purpose person that he trusted with everything, including his bank accounts. 
Uh, but I want to talk to you about the difficulties players have in transitioning over here because the excuse on Otani can't be as simple as he wasn't familiar with gambling rules and he doesn't know the difference between a DraftKings and uh, and a uh, and a uh, you know a guy named Manny who's running a syndicate like. The, the controversy is a weird one, and I don't think I totally understand what he might be guilty of here. Right. And, and I'm with you, too, Dan. I think we need to ask like a million more questions about this. And it really hurt yesterday that no one was allowed to ask a question. I will say, however, he was way more forthcoming than I thought he was going to be. He was angrier, more emotional, more passionate than I thought. I thought he was going to read a canned press release saying, hey, I can't talk about this. We'll talk about it at the proper time. There's an investigation going on. Instead, there were times I felt like he looked up from his script and actually spoke to us. And I think he deserves certainly a little bit of credit for doing that. Now, however, we still have a zillion questions like, where did how could he not know that four point five million dollars was taken from him? How could he not know that his interpreter was doing something like this? Maybe rich people do this all the time. These are the questions I still need to know. But I will tell you, for the most part, and maybe this is my nature, I believed most of what he said yesterday, and others have told me I am completely wrong about that. But I don't know how he could not know what was going on, and those are the questions that need to be answered. Here's the problem with you, Kirkshin, and your eternal niceness. Everyone can get away with everything because the whole steroid thing happened right under your nose. You're a journalist, and the whole thing happened right under your nose. So you're like, I believe Otani. The truth is, I do too. But they can get away with anything on your watch, Kirkshin, because you you love the sport too much. <laughs> look at him. Look how disappointed he is with the, he's, he's Are you mad at me? Did I just actually enrage Tim Kirkshin? No, it happened under your nose, too. Tell his ass. It happened Tell his under ass. everyone's nose. Oh. The best investigative reporters in the game didn't know this was going on. Look, I'm not going to make any excuses for me. I missed the story badly, as we all did. But you can't just be covering the game, asking a baseball question, and then say, oh, are you doing steroids? It just doesn't work that way. When they brought... You know, Mark Fanaruwada in, and he went undercover for two years. That's how you get the story. That's how you figure this out. No excuses. I missed it. I miss a lot of things. That's the way it works. I've got a two-pronged question, though, because you know more about history and perspective in this realm than a great many of the people who cover anything, never mind just baseball. The weirdness of what happened with an interview that then looked like a cover-up that then becomes massive theft and makes all of this so much worse because you've got a disavowed interview. Can you please take me through where this ranks for you in terms of weird scandal, at least in part because of that weird interview situation? Yeah, this is the strangest, most confusing, most confounding story that I think I've seen in the 40 four years that I have covered. And mainly because, A, we're talking about not just the biggest star in the game, we're talking about the biggest athletic star in sports today and one of the greatest stars in the history of baseball. And Dan, I have never seen a story change as quickly as it did in a 24 hour period from, this is what Shohei did, oh no, it's a massive, theft. That's what confused me. And that's why we're on this and why we need to get to the bottom of it with a million more questions. But I know I have slapped my forehead a hundred times since this story came out. Uh, what happened here? Who can explain this? And we still don't have an explanation, but I still think we got at least a little bit of clarity yesterday that we didn't have the day before. One of the big things, Tim, yesterday that confused me, I guess, was kind of when he was telling the story, and, and if you go by the timeline of how things have been going on, right? Because the fact that is that it was going on in two different countries at the same time, right? In different time zones or whatever. But I think at one point he said yesterday, I didn't really think anything was amiss until after Ipe was talking to the entire clubhouse. He was saying it in English, and I realized something's off here. The thing that I thought was a little strange about that is by the timeline, unless I'm wrong, at that point, Ipe had already conducted the interview. It had been disavowed. And, like, 
I just don't understand how no one else in Shohei's camp said anything to him. Like, hey, something's going on here. It took until after that conversation in the clubhouse and then a one-on-one -on -one conversation the two of them allegedly had in a hotel where he said, oh, okay, like something's actually on. Like, how did how was no one else in his team kind of telling him, hey, something's happening here. You should be paying attention to this. Yes, I, I'm with you, Billy. Someone should have prepped him before the interpreter addressed the team and said, here's what he's planning on saying in English. We will translate for you if you don't understand. But, you know, Shohei understands more English than most people think. That goes for Ichiro and a lot of other guys who come over. They just choose not to speak because it can get them in more trouble than good. But I'm with you on that. I, that that's one of many things that I can't comprehend. How is he hearing this for the first time? when they're having this club out meeting and he's standing there listening to what the guy is saying. Someone should have prepped him in advance. Tim, I'm, I'm from the hood and this is a simple case to me. I see it with my eyes closed. I got a homeboy. He took a charge from my homeboy. He has a lot of money. He said, if I ever get messed up, will you take this charge from me? And he took the charge on the chin. He got two years left on his sentence. I think that Ipe is just a stand-up friend, and he's getting too much piled on him right now. And they had this already planned out, but this is the role he signed up for. What do you say to that, Brother Tim? Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> well, as we know in the NBA, which I love, by the way, there's – the, the difference between a block and a charge is really difficult to ascertain. I think this was a block. This wasn't necessarily a charge. I, we have to believe one of these two guys at this point, and I am inclined to believe Shohei. Now, do I believe everything that he said? Well, I find that hard to believe everything. When he came out and said this is an absolute lie, um, he better be right about that. I never bet on baseball. I never placed a bet. Look, the federal government knows all about this inquiry, or they will. If he lied, his career is going to be over one way or another. So I just can't believe he would come out and tell a bald-faced lie when already the feds are on this. That's the way it was explained to me yesterday by a lawyer who didn't necessarily believe everything that Shohei said, but said he was well prepared for that interview or that that statement that he made. That's the part of this, Tim, that I think is confusing, right? Because like I, I do not believe that an MLB investigation is going to turn up anything that's going to have actual implications for Shohei. Just because I think that this is a different time than Pete Rose, for example, right? Where, like, baseball is now a business. And if your biggest star is putting your business in a position, are you going to side with business or integrity, right? So, like, they can say, oh, we looked, nothing turned up. But when you start lying in a federal investigation, you need to see it through. Like, he has to now say, this man stole $4.5 million from me, and he has to send his friend to jail, or he's going to be in trouble. It felt like what happened was... And this is just a theory. Hey, you're in trouble here. You know, I got you. Oh, wait, no, that might be illegal where, what you're doing. Right. We're flipping it on you. But now he has to kind of ride this entire thing out, correct? Allegedly. 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 $4, Allegedly. Million, $4 million is nothing for me. Uh, Tim, you could speak to this part of it as well because you have the history of knowing what these translators do while Otani's life is the, the strangest in all of baseball. Uh, in terms of what surrounds him, media members just following him everywhere and the translator acting in some cases as a 24 hour concierge who introduces you to a different culture so that you can concentrate on your business. Can you speak to what, how unique this relationship is and whether or not a, a friend would just take the hit on something like it's that? Because concierge. Just... Boom, I think he was talking about boom, traffic boom, cones. Yeah. A person an accent they over the O is boom, just yeah. boom, yeah. no, it's Concierge. <laughs> Live at all. All right, Dan, I'll attempt to answer this. Daniel Kim used to be a translator for the Mets. And he has come out and said, as a translator, he did virtually everything for his players. He, he opened up bank accounts for them. He handled their utility bills. He went to the cleaners for them. These guys come over here and they need help on everything. And the FAs of the world help in every single way. and But I still don't understand how someone could be this helpful and still take 
allegedly take this kind of money and no one knows about it. it that's the, the part that I need questions answered. Tim, what if in my most utopian, naive form, I was to present to you the following, the following idea. It's really hard for Otani to be great at baseball and transition culturally. Wow, he did both of those things well. Is his translator somebody like a legion of people in his economy who exists to simply help him with everything so that he doesn't have to be a grown adult who learns America but just gets to be sports star who knows baseball? Is it possible that Shohei Otani only crime here is being super, super trusting of somebody who had a gambling problem and just covered him $4 million because currency doesn't even matter to him. He makes so much money. Right. He made $100 million last year, Dan, with endorsements and salary. And yes, I think that's his biggest mistake here is he was too trusting and he was too naive and he didn't know what was going on when he should have. But I think the way I think you presented it perfectly. He comes here and says, I'm going to be the most remarkable baseball player ever. But the only way to do that is to be completely regimented when I get to the ballpark and have everything already done for me when I get here so I can be the most disciplined player in the world so I can pitch and hit like nobody else in the history of baseball. I think he gave it to his interpreter and said, you need to handle the rest of this. I don't have time for this. I have to sleep 10 hours a day. I have to get to the ballpark. I have to hit. I got to throw a bullpen. And I think that's what happened here. That's my guess. We're all guessing still. But yes, is that plausible? Yes, I think it is. Not only that, though, Tim, you're uniquely qualified to talk about this part of it. And this is where I think you can offer an insight to how it is something this uh, strange and stupid can happen. Tim, you're the only person that I know who has the words and the respect of history who can explain to us how hard it is to do what Otani is doing. The greatness of that, how it is you can't do that part-time because you're just really good at baseball. That, that how hard it is for him to master and excel at that must require a regimen that, us have, that we have no understanding of and would require a team of people to make him a baseball-playing toddler who is great but might not know how to exist in this country around fame and temptation. Right. Dan, you're right. He throws a baseball 100 miles an hour. He hits baseballs thrown at him at 100 miles an hour. And his exit velocity, not my favorite term, is well over 100 miles an hour when he really swings the bat well. And he can fly on the bases. So he recognizes that nobody else can do this. But the only way that he can do all of those things is to give everything else in his life to somebody else. And it, it, you know, it angered some of the angel writers in his six years there that he rarely spoke to them. He would only speak after games in which he pitches. Well, he did that because he needed to keep his focus. I'm certainly not defending him. But if you're going to do something that no one else in the history of baseball has done, you're going to have to go out about things a little differently. You can't just do everything by yourself. You need someone to do virtually everything for you away from the field. But we're also like infantilizing him, right? Like we're kind of like we like him. So we're giving him passes on a lot of things. Like he's he had a wife that no one knew existed. He had a dog that he just refused to tell anyone of the dog's name. Like he likes to be secretive, too. Like it's capable. He just likes to be a private guy. Not he can't focus on anything but baseball. He could just be really good at baseball. Well, what's most probable here? What is most probable? Is it your your theory that there's total innocence or, or Billy's cynicism that stop making this a child who doesn't know anything? I'm just speaking to how hard I'd have it in Japan. Like, if you put me in Japan right now, I'm 55. <laughs> I, I couldn't get something out of a vending machine. Like, I, I'd be, Mike! Mike, what do I... I, 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 I like, if you put me in, J in Japan, I'm, th I'm 30 years older than Otani. And I'm not great at... Things that he's great at. You've got enough problems right. in this country. <laughs> you don't does, speak Tim, Japanese? does Shohei need Major League Baseball? Because it feels like Major League Baseball needs Shohei more than he needs Major League Baseball. Bar. Uh, look, Shohei needs Major League Baseball. All he's ever wanted to do is be the greatest player who's ever played, and he needs Major League Baseball to do that. And I'm with you, Dan. I'm 40 years older than him. And, and I went to a restaurant bar the other day where I had to order something, a beer, off the menu. 
And I couldn't order it because it had one of those little things in the right hand corner that I had to put my phone up next to. I didn't even know how to order <laughs> a beer at a restaurant. I had to ask the waitress, how does this work? She said, well, put your phone up. I said, can you just get me a Miller Lite? Because I don't know how to do this. Oh, she great said, taste. Okay. oh yeah, 96 calories. I'd like my audience to know that they should they should support is this a great game or what because Tim is insistent about doing some things he's learned later in life that he hasn't learned earlier in life because he's been chasing a baseball around all his life and he doesn't know how to do anything and he doesn't know what a barcode is. Right. <laughs> in a bar, I don't know what a barcode is. Um, I'm doing a podcast with my son because I've always wanted to do this. And I hesitate to say this, Dan, but we're going to try to make it a little bit like your show. It's going to be a bit of a pirate ship, except we're going to try to make people comfortable on it as opposed to uncomfortable. For instance, we have Chris Young, the general manager of the Rangers, as our guest on our second episode. And instead of asking him, hey, can the Rangers repeat? Or when is Max Scherzer coming back? Classic we game. asked him about the free throw shooting contest that he got in when he was playing for the Padres. Chris Young, of course, played basketball at Princeton. He told a hilarious story. I asked him about being the tallest guy ever to hit a triple in a major league game. He told us that story. We were laughing out loud. After that, we have John Smoltz on. And instead of asking him, you know, tell us how great Greg Maddox was, we asked him about golf because it's running during Masters Week. So he explained his 11 holes in one. He explained pitching to Tiger Woods in a simulated game that I happened to be at 15 years ago. He explained how he was five shots ahead behind Jeff Francoeur going into 18, his dear friend, and beat him by five shots. He took a four and and. Frank Gore took a 14. Those are the kind of questions we're asking. This is going to be joyful. This is going to be playful. There's no heavy lifting. There's no breaking news. We're going to have a good time with two, uh, two people who love the game and who love each other, as corny as that sounds. We love you, too. You know this. Uh, let's see if we give him a couple of these on the way out. Are you guys ready? Uh, it feels uh... <laughs> Are you ready? Wonderful guys, energy by you, though. Well, guys, especially with yeah. the setup. <laughs> uh, the the reason I'm trying to I'm trying to build up, but lower expectations as well. Those are difficult things to do t together. Uh, does Baker Mayfield look <laughs> look? Hold on a second. Wait, we're off to a good start, though. <laughs> does Baker Mayfield look like the bartender at a TGI Fridays who doesn't know how to work the TV remote when you ask to change the channel? <laughs> Does Gardner Minshew look like he doesn't count the days, but rather makes the days count? Oh, okay. <laughs> Does Bruce Pearl look like he takes his son-in-law's side during the divorce from his daughter? <laughs> Does Brian Dayball look like Kurt Angle's brother, Bert, <laughs> Bert Angle. Yes, that's good. <laughs> and is the good. That is that last true. one is good. He does. He does. He looks like Bert it's Angle. True. He loses every time. He wears beige shorts. He's not a, yeah. Bert <laughs> Angle's no good. It's damn true. Dan, uh, Dan, before I go, just tell me one more. Uh, no, wait. Adnan called me the other day. Please. Give me the Adnan looks like, please. Okay, I don't know if I could do it off the top of my head, but Adnan Verk uh, look, <laughs> looks like he's the man standing on the shoreline when uh, James Bond crawls to shore and says, welcome to Tangier, Mr. Bond. <laughs> And remember, I did a game with him on national TV, and Aaron Judge hit a homer, and that was his home run call. Welcome to Tangier. All of your <laughs> stupid show was so bad. It was so funny. Uh, we love seeing you, buddy. And again, check out Tim's new podcast. Make it every time we tell you to do this, you make these things climb right up the charts. Uh, this is going to be a nice project, and it's going to be a joyful one that Tim gets to do with his son Jeff. It is this a great game or what? New episodes every Tuesday. Tim, we love you, buddy, and we miss you. You can't be on enough. All right. Love you guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, and thanks for the support. Uh, we do need to start a segment with Tim where we just ask him things he can't do around the house. It's going to be eternally funny. <laughs>